I would like you to introduce uh, uh, Professor Rakic, who is a director of uh, the Center for the Studies of Bioethics at the University of Belgrade. We are very happy and honored to have him here because um, he uh, he's authors of many publications at international level, and he also was uh, and is a part of uh, um, one of the main member of this debate in, uh, on uh, moral bioenhancement, on the question and the problems raising uh, and arising by uh, moral bioenhancement. Uh, so we are ha very happy, and uh, I give him the stage. I leave him at the stage to present uh, human enhancement and EU policy making the case of moral bioenhancement. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, um, Silvia Salardi. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, for coming. I'm um, uh, happy to be uh, to be here. Uh, it is not my first time in Milan, but it's uh, I'm happy to be here uh, again. The weather is uh, uh, unusual for Milan, but uh, that makes things uh, additionally uh, uh, interesting. Well. Uh, moral bioenhancement is uh, uh, has become in the recent years, say after 2010, approximately one of the main uh, debates in contemporary bioethics. The enhancement debate focused before more on uh, other forms of human enhancement. Uh, enhancement of physical functions, cognitive enhancement, and so on. But after 2008, Thomas Douglas, who published an article on uh, moral enhancement, started to debate about the possibilities to use biotechnologies to become more moral. And the issue became whether something like that uh, is possible and is ethical and whether it can have the effects uh, we want it to have and which are the effects we would like to make it have. So that is what my focus will be, moral bioenhancement. I will say in that context also something about the, uh, uh, the consequences of that what uh, uh, a group of authors claim, including myself, what the consequences for that will be uh, for, uh, could be for, uh, uh, for policy making. I will interrupt my lecture a couple of times asking you whether you have any questions. So in order not to talk all the time, one and a half hours without you asking questions, I will um, ask you from time to time to ask questions during uh, um, uh, during the lecture. Okay. Well, the whole debate on enhancement started with the issue of performance enhancement. John Harris is probably the philosopher who started this uh, uh, this whole debate on human enhancement. Uh, and as John Harris is, those who know him know that he is a witty person. Uh, so in one of his articles on moral enhancement, he referred to Thomas Douglas, who I mentioned that as the person who published in 2008 the first article on moral enhancement, because John Harris is sometimes called the father of enhancement. He called Tom Douglas the grandfather of moral enhancement, and at that time, Tom Douglas was 29. But as he, as a young man, started the whole debate, uh, John Harris started to call him the grandfather of moral enhancement, which is, um, if you put it in an article, I, people tend to think that's, um, uh, that's worthy when you call something who is at that age a grandfather. In any case, the issue of performance enhancement one of the p persons who started it, John Harris, as I said. First of all, doping in sports. It's obvious that that is a type of performance enhancement. There are certain rules who ban doping, as you know, and athletes are being, uh, they, they suffer certain consequences most of the time if they're caught. 
uh, in enjoying doping. But cognitive enhancement can also be a type of doping. There are certain substances that are considered as beneficial for your cognitive performance. The, the most the fre frequently uh, cited substance of that type is um, methylphenidate, uh, popularly called in the US, not popular, but marketed in the US is Ritalin. I don't know what in Italy if it's called Ritalin or Concerta it may be called here. Ritalin, okay, because in France I think it's concerta. In any case, it helps your attention. Um, it makes you work with less sleep, so you are not tired after having four hours of sleep. You perform better at the cognitive level. Your motivation gets enhanced and so on. Intelligence not, although as uh, memory is considered as part of in IQ tests, it tests as part of your intelligence, as Ritalin is stimulative for your memory. It might, in that aspect, also enhance your intellectual capabilities at the time you use it, because more attention, better memory, a higher IQ. Is that cheating if you take it during the exams? In sports, it's cheating. Is it cheating if you take it uh, while preparing the exams or during the exams, just before taking the exams? Uh, in the US, around, according to some data, around 40% of, around of high school students use it. An internet uh, uh, survey found that 60% of scientists use it. To, perform, to enhance their performance. Although it's not a representative sample, 60 because it are those only who reacted to the internet poll. In some countries it's less, like for instance in Holland and Belgium it's a few percent, but it's rising. And also in the UK, there's some, something as far as I know in between the levels that are relatively low in Holland and high in the US. But it's being obviously being used to enhance your cognitive capabilities. Um, and it's not outlawed. You're not uh, prohibited to use it like you are in sports using doping. Well, concerning performance enhancement, uh, before getting to the theme of moral enhancement, let me say a few words about this. So what are the objections to performance enhancement? I sorted out five of them that are frequently used. First, that it is against nature. Second, that it is cheating. Third, that it gives its users an unfair, it's not cheating, but it gives its users an unfair advantage vis-a-vis -vis their competitors, that it is inegalitarian. Some people have the possibilities, the money or other possibilities to buy it, others don't. And fifth, that it is unsafe or it's unhealthy to use medicines that you don't really need. Ritalin, for instance, is being used uh, as uh, for treating uh, this ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, but it turned out to have these effects that I mentioned. So it remains a medicine, but you can use it as an enhancer. Is it safe to do that? Can you get addicted to it? And so on and so on. And Ritalin is, of course, not the only example of those performance enhancements. I will say a few words uh, against certain of these objections. So against the nature, uh, the bioconservatives uh, are used to uh, employ that argument against performance enhancers like Leon Kass, but also Michael Sandel and some other l less radical uh, bioconservatives. But 
their argument that it is against nature is disputed by various scholars like the mentioned John Harris or Julian Savulescu from Oxford and, and many others who say that nature is morally indifferent. So that the fact that something is unnatural doesn't mean that it is there is something wrong with it. There are many natural things that are not helpful. Earthquakes are natural, uh, tsunamis are natural, and so on. And it doesn't mean that we should uh, evoke them or not defend ourselves against it. Then arguments that you hear sometimes from people, okay, I'm using this medicine, but it's fine, it's a natural medicine. It doesn't have any meaning that it is natural. Snake poison is natural. It doesn't mean that you should take it. Uh, mushrooms are, uh, poisonous mushrooms are, are natural and so on. So that argument that it is against nature uh, is difficult to maintain. What do you think, let me start here the first question. Uh, and uh, stop talking for a minute, asking you what you think about the argument that uh, using uh, cognitive enhancers, enhancers that can improve your cognition, that that is a form of cheating. What do you think? Please feel free, complete. I'm there. The, 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 just, just feel relaxed. Uh, there, there, are, uh, there are very different opinions about it. So you will, whatever you say, will not, <laughs> will probably not be uh, strange. So, so. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understood it. Uh, uh, okay, um, you, you you focus more on the uh, on the distinction between um, treatment and enhancement. You understand? Uh, um, so you 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 focus more on that. So my focus is more: is it cheating? Cheating means literally cheating, like you're playing cards and <laughs> playing <laughs> it in a cheatful way. So you. You're an athlete, you're full of steroids, uh, doping, and you perform better. It's outlawed, you're cheating, you get disqualified. If you use at your exam, you are the only one in this university, for instance, who has access to Ritalin because you're smarter than the others and found a way to get to it or you have a friend who is um, who is a doctor and who gave it to you or whatever or you have it you, you 
purchased, purchased it via the internet, whatever. So you're the only or, or one of the 50 students who have it and 200 students don't have it. So is it cheating? Is it? I'm asking the question. Okay, so my, my, uh, <laughs> my, answer, my answer is that it's not cheating. Why not? Because cheating is relative to a certain rule. And in sports, you have a rule. Here you don't have a rule. It doesn't mean that we don't need rules. But there are no rules. There is no rule that says you're not allowed to take Ritalin, methylphenidate, or whatever substance before or during the exam. There is no such rule. So you cannot, there is nothing to cheat on. In sports, you have a rule that prohibits doping. So there is something to cheat on. Here, you cannot cheat if there is nothing to cheat on. No rules, no cheating. But again, I'm not saying that such rules shouldn't be introduced, but that's a different question. But it is in any case not cheating in this sense. But does it give an unfair advantage to the users of that? So in one way, it does, of course. On the other hand, those who use it can say, well, I'm, nature has not endowed me with the intelligence he or she has been endowed with. So I am morally allowed to use it because it's not my fault that nature or God hasn't given me the intelligence person A has. I person B have a lower level of intelligence. It's not my fault. It's the fault of nature. Nature is, um, is uh, unfair. God is unfair. So I will fight this unfairness by using this substance. That would be the argument that it is not an unfair advantage. And this argument is being given by certain scholars like Savulescu. Inegalitarian, okay, obviously some people can get access to uh, those substances, some cannot. Uh, but you have that, it's the, again a counter argument, you have that also in, uh, in anything. Some people have sufficient money to uh, do all kinds of cosmetic surgeries and to make themselves look better. Other people don't even have medicines for malaria or one billion of people, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't have access to healthy or to safe drinking water. Can you imagine uh, worse inequalities than that? So inequalities are everywhere so the argument can be, well, why focus on the inegalitarian element in cognitive enhancement if the world is so full of much more drastic inequalities in the global population? So the wealth of the world is... Uh, According to some data, I will make a mistake because I don't have the data in front of me, but it is close to what I'm going to say. Uh, the 10 or 20 richest people in the world have more money than half of the world population at the lower level. So three and a half billion people have less than 10 or 20 rich people in the world. Why focus on inegalitarianism in this when you have such drastic forms of inegalitarianism? That would be an argument against it. And that it's unsafe. 
well, some medicines are, some medicines are not unsafe. Um, smoking is unsafe, obviously. It's not prohibited. Why should Ritalin be prohibited for this kind of uh, use? Or um, a cognitive enhancer is also coffee, in a way, because it makes you able to sleep less and to be awake and to do your exams better than if you come at the exam and you sleep, you have a coffee, you're more likely to have uh, to do it better. Then we might think, well, why not prohibit coffee before the exams? So these objections to performance enhancement are, uh, well, they can be brought into question. I'm not saying that they should be allowed, but there are strong arguments for strong arguments against the arguments that are against the objection. So there are, a, it, it's possible to defend the positions and bioliberals do that, that cognitive enhancement is morally allowed. Now, coming to the theme of moral enhancement, that is where it becomes really interesting. Tom Douglas in 2008 said that that is he, the 28-year-old at that time grandfather of moral enhancement. Uh, what is unfair, he asks, in being morally enhanced? Because by being morally enhanced, you just have morally better, better motives than you otherwise would have had. So why would that be unfair vis-a-vis -vis your competitors? So if we focus on this one, unfair advantage, that's a strong argument that you have an uh, unfair advantage. But in the case of, for performance and against performance enhancement, I think this is an, the strongest argument against, uh, in comparison with all, with all of them. But in the case of moral enhancement, what is unfair? You have competitors. We live in a competitive world. And what do you do? You take certain substances that increase your empathy. What kind of unfair advantage do you get towards the others who don't have your level of empathy? Perhaps you bring yourself even at a disadvantage because you are more empathetic towards the people um, around you than the ones who don't use it. And the substances that can morally enhance you, there are a variety of them that are being discussed. Uh, the, probably the most discussed one is oxytocin. It's a hormone uh, uh, more present in women or, uh, in general than in men, uh, produced uh, in women in higher uh, doses than, than normally during pregnancies and, and breastfeeding uh, uh, and in both men and women uh, during sex and, uh, and other uh, or physical contact in general. So higher levels of oxytocin in your blood mean uh, more empathy. Empathy is important for our morality because it is the basis of the golden rule. If you have empathy, you are more likely not to do to other people what you don't want the other people to do to you. The golden rule, do to the others what you want others to do to you, more empathy, a higher likelihood that you will do something that is against this so-called golden rule. So it's not, of course, the, the only morally important, um, uh, it's not the only basis of morality. Um, just retribution is also a type of morality that those that doesn't have to be connected with um, with uh, empathy can be even against it. So uh, that those who have violated certain moral norms that they suffer consequences for having done that. It's a kind of retributional justice, if I'm um, 
uh, if I may use uh, legal terms in front of lawyers, so I'm not a lawyer, but um, uh, but empathy is also very important. Not only oxytocin, but uh, so-called SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It are substances you find in many most antidepressives now. Also lower your aggression, uh, increase your empathy, and some, also some neuro neurosurgical interventions can seemingly do that because some neurological uh, basis of morality have been identified. Uh, so you have uh, the prefrontal or I'm now translating just a moment in the or in the orbital frontal cortex that's here and in the dorsolateral cortex you th there have been regions identified that uh, are responsible for your moral functioning. So certain neurosurgical interventions like deep brain stimulation and so in those regions of your brain can increase your empathy. And in the dorsolateral cortex can even increase your utilitarian thinking. So certain types of morality, I don't know to what extent you're aware of the difference between deontology and utilitarianism. Okay, in any case, different kinds of morality, different regions in the brain. That's still very experimental. But oxytocin and so on has already been proven to increase, decrease your aggression, increase your empathy and so on. Probably uh, some people explain uh, also the uh, uh, lower inclination towards the violence among women than among men that oxytocin is responsible for that. So you have it already with children in schools. I mean, when, when girls punish another girl, they usually do it by excommunicating her. It's painful. But boys <laughs> do, do it in a different way. It's, I'm not sure, uh, by the way, whether it's more, more painful to get hit like a boy or to get excluded like so, so perhaps exclusion is more painful even but it's less obviously aggressive and the girls stand you see it all the time in school when a girl suffers or a boy I'm girls are around there to hug and uh, boys are less inclined generally to do that uh, those who make this argument say oxytocin is responsible for that and in the 1990s in the US, you already had, it, it was widely used, oxytocin nasal spray because it passed the blood very quickly. So you put oxytocin in your nose, so it's, it works quickly. So the, the books on parenthood, so in the, I rem in, in the 1990s, a long time ago, you could read already at that time, okay, mothers who don't like to breastfeed, how they should stimulate their inclination to breastfeed because breastfeeding is good for the baby. It's by the way finding that it's being brought into question now, but okay, that's <laughs> everything. But at that time it was believed that it's essential to breastfeed. So if you don't do that, you should use all kinds of techniques to stimulate yourself to increase your wish to breastfeed and then it was written in this guide for parenthood or for motherhood and if it doesn't work why not try oxytocin nasal spray i'm talking about the period 20 years ago or even no, 20 years ago so it already was known at that time now people like persons of less can say okay we should not only make oxytocin nasal spray available, but all kinds of cognitive answers we should put in, uh, like floor in, the, in drinking water or, or uh, 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 um, you, you, you should put oxytocin SSRIs in all, all kinds of stuff people eat. Alimentari? 
Is, is that the Italian word? Food, food stuff, yeah. Okay. And, of course, if we talk about moral enhancement, we should ask ourselves, well, why should we morally enhance ourselves? The argument Ingmar Persson and Julian Savulescu from Oxford make is the following, that human moral psychology has been adapted through evolution to taking care about small groups, your near and dear, your close kin, and to the immediate future. As a prehistoric man or woman, you didn't think what will happen to this world probably, I mean, in, in 2000 years, will the world survive? I mean, you cared about surviving yourself and making your nuclear family survive. That came down to that, we can imagine, and not to worries about the whole of humanity or for the far future of humans. So human moral psychology, and we still, of course, have a higher inclination to help our family, our children, our parents, uh, and so on, and our friends than someone in, in Japan or whatever. So we do care more about our near and dear, and we tend to think about our immediate future, future that is important for us, and not, not many people, th I think, are very concerned about the issue whether this world will survive in 300 years. It's very important, of course, whether we'll, this planet will be inhabitable in, two, in 300 years. But it's not our immediate future. It will not, if it was something that was about to happen next year, we would have been very concerned. 200 or 300 years before, it's, it's not something we think about. This human moral psychology say person in Savulescu. And they say because that is the case, humanity is in danger of extinction because the technologies have developed so fast that humanity has the capability to cause what they call ultimate harm. So either the destruction of the planet or humanity on the planet or the planet being downgraded in terms of living conditions to the degree that worthwhile life on this planet is not worth living anymore, that life is not worth living anymore. So in order to avoid that, they say, moral bioenhancement, moral biological, biotechnological enhancement, I call it moral bioenhancement, should become compulsory, not voluntary. And as I said, it should be put into um, uh, food, drinking water, and so on. The substances that, that work, that increase their empathy, lower their aggression, and so on. And then we lower the likelihood of ultimate harm. So their argument is very consequentialist, utilitarian. So we would like to survive as humanity. We're not moral enough to think about the farther future and about the whole of humanity. So we should become morally enhanced by the use of the substances we talked about. Is this clear? What I'm talking? Yeah? If you have questions, please interrupt you 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 can in you can uh, talk italian i understand it uh, uh, to some degree uh, you, you you can talk either italian or english può parlare italiano Capisci un poco, no? <laughs> Capisco poco. Come deve, per esempio, nel futuro, è prima l'economico, cioè un interesse economico, sì, nel senso, 
เออSo this is, uh, uh, as Professor Salari said, it's uh, um, an, an, an ethical discussion, and it can be or it, uh, should be the basis of what will follow in terms of legal solutions to those issues. But uh, what do you think? Will humanity survive uh, in, uh, in, 2000, in 200 years? What do you think? Two, two, two hundred years. No, no, two thousand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't understand. Yeah, the uh, the the problem the problem can be that I mean humanity is advancing ethically through the it's still far from being good good enough perhaps but it's advancing when you compare it to two thousand years ago when most people were slaves you still have slaves but not that many in percentage wise and uh, no one. Uh, in Greece, you have you, philosophers, Plato, Aristotle, and so, that are people who are slaves by nature, and they all justified it. Nowadays, the slave traders in, uh, in Libya or in Chad and so on, they are not bragging about being slave traders. They don't claim, I have the moral right to own people. No one appears on TV saying that I have a moral right to own people and to do to them what I like. They are my slaves. I have a moral entitlement to that. 
it are people who are criminals and who are aware of that the fact that they're criminals so they do it but they and various other decrees in violence and some uh, Steven Pinker's book uh, the better angels of our world and some shows that humanity is becoming morally enhanced through the centuries but is that enough to avoid ultimate harm because even one lunatic is enough to cause enormous the lunatic doesn't have to be the president of, of the US or Russia or China and so on who can use nuclear weapons to destroy the, the, the planet easily uh, the lunatic can be any lunatic who makes in a home lab for instance something resembling smallpox bioterrorism it's relatively easy to do in terms of facilities you need the know-how but some of the terrorists are very well educated at uh, frequently US universities Harvard Princeton and they are trying to develop uh, or some of them developed terrorist agents so uh, can you imagine you know the the incubation period for smallpox is I think three weeks smallpox is uh, how it's called in Italian it's in most countries it's called a big pox but in English it's called smallpox it's the deadly disease the worst type uh, measles you, you have measles you have morbilla you have varicella and variola is smallpox Va variola variola is smallpox yeah for some reason in English called smallpox but it's it's <laughs> it's the big <laughs> the big troublemaker it's doesn't exist anymore practically in the world because you have exceeds but it's a deadly disease 80 percent fatal I think in the developed world 100 years ago I'm not sure but something like that 70 80 percent now someone develops a kind of virus resembling smallpox that is 100 percent fatal and with an incubation period of not three weeks but six months for instance and bioterrorists infect themselves with it travel from airport to airport six months traveling you you have it it's spread around the whole world and it might annihilate humankind or bring the level of survivors to a very low uh, a stage so one lunatic is enough actually to cause ult ultimate harm so the fact that humanity is advancing morally is not enough and that is also the problem with what person and Savulescu say you th these these things may be helpful for humanity in general but what are you going to do with the single lunatics so I'm, I'm not sure whether 200 years uh, who knows uh, it's uh, if uh, for some reason human humanity does survive in 200 years then several thousands years later we may expect a very different of course highly technologically developed world and possibly also humans inhabiting other planets in a few thousand years or perhaps earlier than that you can see it. but in the first instance humanity needs to survive this period of the next centuries okay and um, so personal Savulescu say it should be compulsory okay the grand rationale for making it compulsory is the lowering of the likelihood of ultimate harm as I said and they even introduce in their theory a very extravagant mechanism um, 
called the God machine. And the God machine is a kind of, it's a futuristic concept, a kind of brain implant that as soon as you develop a highly immoral thought, it reacts by deleting this thought. So you cannot realize your highly immoral thought. And uh, that is their vision of how, in the final instance, this ultimate harm, the destruction of humanity, should be avoided. Okay, I, in 2014, I made an argument ag against Persson and Savulescu in the Journal of Medical Ethics. Savulescu is the editor of that journal, by the way. So, uh, I said that by making moral bioenhancement compulsory, we would deprive ourselves of freedom. Because if we don't have the freedom to realize certain immoral thoughts, it might be good not to be immoral, but if a mechanism intervenes as soon as you develop such a thought, you lose your free will. So someone other than you decides what you're going to will. It's not a legal sanction. A legal sanction is, okay, when you do something nasty, you do something criminal, you go to jail or you pay a fine and so on. But you're free to do that. But here you're not free to think about it. It even infringes upon your freedom of thought because as soon as you develop such a thought, the programmed device in your brain reacts and this thought is being deleted. So by depriving ourselves of freedom, we are depriving ourselves of an important element of our human existence. Because if we are not free, can we be called humans? Because the, an argument uh, used even by the ancient Greeks about the difference between humans and animals, it's doubtful that, that, that there is this difference to that degree. But okay, their argument was that humans have a free will or yeah, after the ancient Greeks, this argument was also used, the humans have a free will, but animals don't. So animals are slaves to their instincts. So if we are hungry during the lecture, we can postpone our wish to eat and say, okay, we'll wait till the end of the lecture and then we are going to eat. But an animal is the slave to its instincts in the sense that if you have, I don't know, a cat here and you have a can with sardines or so, the cat will not say, okay, uh, Professor Rakic is teaching, let me sit here until he finishes and then I'll eat my uh, sardines. It will jump if it judges that the environment is safe enough and grab the sardines and enjoy them. So, and, but humans can postpone the gratification of their needs. And that is allegedly why they will have a free will and animals not. If you deprive humans of that, you take away their free will, you take away an essential part of their humanity, of the humanness. Do you understand that? Okay. Yes? Uh, okay. Uh, and Persson and Savulescu reacted to what I said also in this Journal of Medical Ethics, saying that I consider, and, and uh, someone else also published uh, uh, an article against my position, Selgalid Michael, uh, uh, that uh, I'm considering freedom as a threshold concept, either or, so you are free or not free, whereas freedom is a matter of degree, they say. My reply was that, in another journal then, that freedom as a political concept or one that is anal analogous to a political concept is indeed scalar in nature. But freedom of the will 
is a threshold concept, and that is what I was talking about, and it's not subject to degree. In other words, you can have, in politics, you can have more or less free elections, more or less free media. You can say media in Italy or in the US are free, but some can make the argument they are not entirely free because the influence of people with um, enormous uh, wealth on media are there, so the media are not really free. But you cannot say that they are, of course, like media in North Korea or so. So it's a matter of degree. You can say watching CNN, for instance, and watching the campaign against Trump, no matter what you think about Trump, but you see that the media, that CNN is having a campaign against Trump, which doesn't look then like a, like, like a liberal TV station anymore when, when, when you watch it. I'm not talking about Trump, perhaps he should be even criticized more than that, but I'm talking about media, which are not even trying to be objective. But okay, you still have, of course, in the US, media who are even on Trump's side and so on. So there is some, whether media are free, it's a matter of degree. But they are not, again, like in North Korea, but they're also not perhaps um, uh, as free as in some, some, some other countries. So it's a matter of degree elections. Uh, elections uh, in there were periods then in certain countries you had only one candidate at elections and one party and one candidate. So there was absolutely no choice. The only choice was not to go or to go to elections and when you don't go, then you get trouble with the secret police because they know who didn't go so they call you and then why didn't you go to the... So there no choice at all. That are obviously unfree elections. But you can have elections in which you have more candidates, more parties, but in which media have a very, very intensive campaign in favor of the dominant party in that country. Various examples. So it's a matter of degree, freedom, it, as a political concept. But when we talk about free will, it's a threshold concept. It's either yes or no. It's not subject to degree. How can we call a person A free if a God machine, call it like that, intervenes as soon as he develops an immoral thought and deletes that thought? It's obviously not anymore a free person. Can you, can you, can, would you be able to call yourself free if I had, imagine even that I was absolutely the most moral person or mechanism in the world. But my, uh, uh, my power is to delete a thought that you develop and that I consider as immoral. Would you call yourself free to some degree or entirely unfree? It's entirely unfree. So if someone or a mechanism uh, um, limits your free will, even if it limits it to make you more moral, you have no free will. You, you have a will that is confined to a certain specter of possible thoughts. You have no free will, you have no freedom of thought. And that is the danger in the concept of compulsory moral enhancement as person and Savules could develop it, that you create unfree people, an unfree society. And in their book, uh, Unfit for the Future, they even in one chapter write against uh, liberalism because the, they are liberals politically, but their concept of concept compulsory moral enhancement excludes real liberalism. So they make a distance from, uh, from a liberal society, which they have to do in order to defend their concept of compulsory moral by enhancement. Okay, uh, let me see, okay. Why is a free will not a matter of degree? And that's what they said. As soon as an external mechanism deprives us of our free will to a certain extent, 
limits are being imposed on our freedom to think and we will hence be deprived of our free will in principle so we will not have any free will at all plus as soon as such an external mechanism deprive us of, deprives us of our free will to a certain extent we will be deprived of the very foundation of our moral behavior we will therefore become partially only partially responsible for what we decide to do so if your decision to do something to decide something is partially my decision who limits your thoughts you are divested deprived from full mor moral responsibility you share it with a mechanism that intervenes it is futuristic but not too futuristic it's it's already it goes much faster than we than, than we imagine uh, things that can lead to this sure mm -hmm. Yes. No, no, that's... Uh, uh, but I would like also to know what you think about Thank you, yes, uh, that's a very good point. Um, uh, what uh, Persson and Savulescu try to do is, uh, because legal sanctions we already have, if someone is a bioterrorist who tries to develop a virus that will kill millions of people, he will, of course, be, will go to... Uh, he will suffer consequences, legal consequences of, 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 of what he did, not of his crazy intention. But some of them don't care about the legal consequences. They are suicide bombers, for instance. So Persson and Savulescu want to delete their thoughts even before they can bring that into practice, because if they bring it into practice, it might already be too late. So they are... Uh, they are... Uh, more red, much more radical than uh, uh, 
than that what law does because it they make people not more moral they simply delete their immoral thoughts so they're the people have not become more moral they simply have become more unfree they have become unfree so even incapable of being fully moral because an external mechanism intervenes you have very similar things you don't have to think about the god machine if oxytocin serotonin and so on if they are parts of drinking water it's already compulsory moral by enhancement so uh, uh, the, their, their wish to avoid ultimate harm, that's the essential wish. So they think that humanity will not survive and that therefore freedom, the freedom of humans should be limited. And freedom is a matter of degree. So I said it's not a matter of degree, free will is an either or concept and that we should not try to survive, to make humanity survive at any cost, if the cost is that humans cease to be humans, if they're humans without a free will, we, are, we cease to be really humans. Well, what's, what's a human without a, a free will? It's, it, it's an automaton. So they already, person and Savulescu, in my opinion, already inflict ultimate harm on people they want to prevent ultimate harm but taking away the freedom of people they already inflict ultimate harm by making people by making humans non-human plus even if free will because there is also a, a theory by uh, Libet and, and his followers that people don't have a free will at all. It, I won't go into that because it is will become too technical. That free will is an illusion uh, and that will f totally determined by the biological mechanisms that we perceive as free, free will but that free will doesn't exist. But even if that is the case, freedom is essential free will is essential for our human identity so we should in order to preserve our human identity at least believe that we have a free will plus certain scholars like Baumeister, uh, Rigoni, Foster, Scholar they showed that free will uh, on the basis of a variety of experiments they conducted and morally responsible behavior are related to each other so that those people who believe in a free will that they are more inclined to help other people, that they are less aggressive, that they are more willing to act in a moral way, and that they have less inclined to cheat and so on. So that belief in free will and moral behavior are correlated. So people who do not believe in a, fr in a free will are more inclined to behave immorally. So you had even their experiments with people who, uh, they, a group of people, they made before the experiment watch uh, a documentary with scholars claiming that people don't have a free will and uh, another group didn't see the this uh, this documentary and then they did all kind of moral games uh, games that tested their morality the group that was exposed to the documentary behaved more immorally less morally in the game than the others and they repeated it various times and all the times it really did happen that as soon as you indoctrinate people that they don't have a free will they are more inclined to behave in an immoral way so even if a free will is an illusion even then it's a, u a useful illusion because it helps our uh, uh, helps us behave more morally so all in all this argument of person and Savulescu is fallacious, in my opinion, at a variety of levels. And we can continue, uh, and perhaps we shouldn't do that because it becomes too, too, uh, too technical, uh, but uh, in any case, I'll mention a few of these, uh, of, of, of these issues that 
compulsory moral bioenhancement. An external mechanism, the state, the God machine, whoever decides about what it decides. So it has certain ends in mind. And if the end, if the objective is even the prevention of ultimate harm, that mechanism has control over the means. So the relationship between means and ends is radicalized. It resembles then the authoritarian states like uh, Nazi Germany or uh, Soviet Russia, where the political elite had a certain vision of a racially superior Aryan race or the dict uh, dictatorship of the proletariat or whatever um, phantasmological idea they had. And all means were allowed to achieve that. And they used indeed all uh, means they had. Doesn't this go into that direction? Because someone, some who who are who is the moral elite in society, person Savulesco or whoever, we don't know it, but a moral elite in society knows what is best for us, and it all means are allowed. Or not all means are allowed, but a very radical means is allowed, and that is to deprive humans of their free will to decide themselves about it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. No, yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, please do 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 that. <laughs> it's uh, okay. Qu questions about it? Uh, and of course, <coughs> if an external mechanism like the God machine or compulsory. Uh, um, uh, administration of oxytocin, serotonin, whatever moral enhancer, raises the question, who has the authority to do that? Who will do that? That's also, of course, a legal matter from various perspectives. So who is the moral elite? Who will say this is a grossly immoral thought? Who will say that? Person in Savulescu? 
the prime minister of uh, of um, Australia, Italy, uh, uh, England, who, who will um, the, the parliament of any country a referendum? But then you have uh, you have nothing because the referendum is already <laughs> all people. <so laughs> yeah. And who elects parliament? The electorate. The, so how is the moral elite going to be chosen then? Because humanity, all citizens should be morally enhanced, but they are the ones who voted the referenda. They are the ones who vote for certain parties and who vote for the president, uh, if you have a presidential system and so on. So university professors, are they more moral than other people? I doubt it. So who, what, 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 what remains? What who? Person and Savulescu who consider themselves uh, as, as those or so it, it, it completely uh, leaves open the question of how to how to bring it into into practice so, so where, what is the moral of the church it would be interesting to see whether yeah wh whether whether um, certain professions, that the people in certain professions are more moral than other people. Priests, university professors, doctors, it should be people who are, who care about other nurses. I don't know, surgeons. They're really, uh, ab absolutely um, uh, unclear. So that's a very practical uh, um, or, or course, state course, but on what base are the courts going to decide that? And then you will say again, court, then the judges are the moral elite. Why, why, why should we be so sure that they are? So it's unsolved entirely in their theory. And obviously the danger of political repression so if you say this is the moral elite, like the Germans and, and the Soviets did uh, in, uh, before the Second World War, this is the moral elite. The, the Communist Party or the Nazi Party is the moral elite. Uh, we, we saw how, how it was the moral elite. So who? The God machine? But who creates the God machine? Again, philosophers, person and civil So I called in my articles, the God machine, I renamed it to the police machine because uh, there is nothing like God in it. Because, because God, at least in the Christian, Jewish, Islamic also tradition, God leaves your freedom of will intact. You are, and that's absolutely the basis also in Christianity, that you're free to sin. You, you know this John Milton's words, uh, God has made man up and right, sufficient to have stood, but free to fall. In a moral, so sufficient to stand, but free to fall morally. So you have the freedom to sin, to morally, to fall in a moral sense. That's the God in the Christian, Judeo-Christian uh, uh, Judeo or Islamic traditions. Not the God machine that says you're not allowed to think this or that. So it's more a police machine, monitoring your thoughts and then acting. Why I call it the, also the police machine? Because it's not even a legal machine. Because it's, no legal decisions have been made. It's only the police who, whose task is to apprehend someone, for instance, who is um, a suspect. So the police doesn't prove that you're guilty. Suspects are sometimes put in jail in a, or, or get, get different treatment. So there is a thought that you developed and the machine, very far from a god that leaves your freedom intact, but the machine that does not leave your freedom intact, the police, it <laughs> puts you into jail <laughs> because you're sus suspect, okay? And uh, 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 so, so it's even a very... Um, Mm. a troublesome name, the God machine, because it's not, go it's not even a legal machine. It's really repressive. It's, it's, it's really what the, uh, 
what what the police does not because the police is repressive but simply because it's the task of the police to before things get to courts and so on to to act in certain ways to prevent crime with the god machine that so so it's a police machine yes Yes, exactly. It's human because someone has to create it. Yeah, who, who will artificial intelligence? Okay, we can think about artificial intelligence in this sense, but who creates uh, uh, the artificial? It, it are again humans. It becomes in, uh, uh, intelligence with a free will, perhaps at one point. But who guarantees that it will be uh, will be moral? Did you see the the, the Sophie robo robot, Sophie the robot? No, in Saudi Arabia, they uh, a couple of months ago, um, uh, a certain uh, a certain company, not a Saudi Arabian company, but in, I think a Japanese company, created a robot, a female-like robot, called Sophie. Or Sophia, and uh, Sophia even has the mimics of a human being like this. It very looks looks really good technically. Uh, even uh, from from time to time, you <laughs> if you d if if you're not careful, you might even think, "Well, oh, this really looks uh, looks human." And she answers questions in this Saudi auditorium with the very wealthy people who were interested in seeing her performance. Uh, she asks, she answers questions, and it looks like in artificial intelligence. So she is even very smart when you listen to this robot on first sight. So uh, the journalist who interviewed Sophia the robot, he asked her. Uh, something like, you, you, you can Google it, Sophia the robot, uh, or Saudi Arabia, Sophie robot, something like. Um, what, what the, so you, you, you can, if, if I make, made a mistake, if I don't remember it exactly, you can, you can, you can Google it, but at you, uh, YouTube. Um, but the question was something like, um, um, how? Uh, are are you human? Uh, and she answered, "No, I'm not. I'm a robot." And then the journalist asked her, uh, "Well, how do you know that if your intelligence has been created by humans? How do you know that you're that you're a robot?" and not a human. And Sophia answered, how do you know that you are human? So uh, yes, so very smart, but of course she's not that smart. She simply turns out answers to keywords. <laughs> so she's completely programmed. So the key and she can manipulate keywords and do it in a very intelligent way. But it's obviously created by humans. So the combination of keywords that appear make her pronounce certain things. So it, it seems to be very, very far still from artificial intelligence, which doesn't mean that artificial intelligence is not close to us. And it is. You can upload, to put it very plastically, slices of your brain, upload it to a computer, and, and it becomes some kind of artificial intelligence at one point. And artificial intelligence, if you create artificial intelligence with a free will, it might lead to the destruction of humanity. And then you have a complete Abs absurdity that person in Savulescu wanted to create, uh, what, but then, <laughs> then they get humans without a free will and artificial intelligence with a free will. So, so and, and humanity disappears. 
but then it really disappears forever and then uh, it disappears totally. Okay. Um, okay, well, I, I suggest that, uh, I mean, this is enough information. I had also uh, something to say about categorical opposition to uh, uh, moral bioenhancement by Harris Weissman, with whom um, I had some debates. Uh, uh, the Milgram experiment. It's also, of course, very interesting. Mm. How much time? Uh, okay, okay. Then I won't go into the. Okay, you can you can see. Uh, perhaps you're also familiar with the Mil Milgram experiment and think about what happened to the free will uh, there. Uh, implications for policy making. Very briefly. These are the questions that you as lawyers and, and as people who uh, think about uh, policy making, and that is the link between my presentation until now and policy making. So should cognitive performance enhancement be regulated? That was the first question I asked. So if it does get regulation, then those who don't who use it, then they are cheating. And then they're subject to legal action, like in doping, in sports. So is cognitive doping, let's call it like that, something that ought to be regulated? Moral bias enhancement, should that be regulated? Or should it remain voluntary, as I claim? Person and Savulescu say, you saw what they say, and they have some, some supporters, not many, but they have them. The issue of the state and freedom. We talked about that. Then incentivizing morality and happiness versus the ultimate harm prevention. So we can incentivize morality. The state can do it by giving affirmative action benefits to the morally enhanced. So if you accept to become morally enhanced by biomedical means, you get schooling allowances for your children, retirement benefits, uh, all kinds of benefits. The state can do that. It's a way to incentivize, to give incentives to those who get moral buy enhancement. Well, but how can, the question is how can the state do that if the state is run by people who are not morally wise enough? Because we have to change them first. And then finally, and that is my final thought, and actually my, at this point of, <laughs> of my intellectual development, that is the, uh, where I stand now, the issue of happiness. So instead of ultimate harm prevention, I propose happiness as the grounding rationale for moral bias enhancement Because various uh, scholars have shown, like Sonia Lubomirsky from UCLA, like uh, Anik and others, on the basis of experiments that happiness and morality operate in a positive uh, uh, that they are positively correlated. So the happier you are, the more likely it is that you will behave more morally. The more morally you behave, the likelier it is that you will be happy. So happier people to simplify it very much. Happier people are more moral, more moral people are happier. So what happiness is obviously in your self-interest. We know we all want to be happy if we are normal. So we might accept voluntarily to subject ourselves to moral enhancement by biomedical means if we think that that will lead not only to our, mor our moral betterment, but also to more happiness. So if we are morally enhanced, we will become more happy. We will become happier. So that might be the link, if we understand this link between morality and happiness. So if we give to charities, if we are good to the people around us, we tend to be happier. It's actually simple, and it's strange that people don't behave in that way more. Simply, there is a reason why we don't do that. 
because we, we all should know that that is in our interest. And because we have certain inhibitions to do that, or many of us have, well, moral enhancers can help in that sense. And our interest might be our happiness. So I think it's not, of course, an ideal thing. There is an element of um, uh, speculation there and so on. But in any case, I think it is a better rationale for moral by enhancement than the one a uh, person in Savulescu uh, give uh, um, uh, because of the very uh, the, the, the reasons I gave. By the way, person in Savulescu, I have nothing against him. They are my friends. So, uh, but I'm, we're polem polemicizing uh, about this. At least I hope they're still my friends because after After this article here, let me see. Yes, in this article here, this and this, they might not be my friends anymore. <laughs> but, but we'll see. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, so this is uh, if 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 you get uh, if, if you have in any case an interest in my my thoughts on the subject. So this is my bibliography, not the bibliography on the subject. So these are the articles, mostly one in one this year, but mostly in 2017. And these are the articles in the American Journal of Bioethics. Uh, uh, this one is the one I refer to: or voluntary moral enhancement and the survival. Of any cost bias to which person in Savulescu replied. Then I replied to them here in the American Journal of Bioethics and in Cambridge Quarterly. So it went uh, from, from article to article. And that's pretty much what I can uh, say in one and a half hours about, about this theme. I hope that you, uh, also you're not ethicists, but, uh, but lawyers, I hope that at least you, I, I, I showed um, the, the links that um, can or ought to be developed between ethics and the legal aspects of this, uh, uh, this issue pertaining to, uh, to policy making and what states, including the European Union, including uh, Supra states that the European Union could do in that regard. So my suggestion would be certainly not to make it compulsory moral by enhancement. And about cognitive performance enhancement and so on, it remains open to see whether to regulate it or not. So that's that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your great lecture. Um ultima una delle ultime slide con tutte quelle domande, no? Se il mio potenziamento morale debba diventare non solo moralmente obbligatorio ma anche giuridicamente obbligatorio perché questo sarebbe lo step successivo eh, e tutte le altre questioni che il professor Racchi ci ha lasciato aperto noi le vedremo eh, nelle lezioni appunto quello particolarmente con le mie lezioni che avete sul syllabus verso aprile con la mia pubblica già in marzo eh, e andremo un po' più a fondo di queste questioni, però era importante avere la posizione di un filosofo, di un filosofo morale, eh, perché i filosofi morali hanno questa capacità di utilizzare in maniera molto acuta gli argomenti pro o contro, loro vanno proprio dentro ogni singola questione e eh, per noi è molto interessante avere quel panorama argomentativo per poi vedere come se si possono trovare delle soluzioni a livello normativo, che peraltro, io vi ho detto fin dall'inizio, il quadro normativo dell'Unione Europea ragionando dentro qui, cioè ragionando, ci dà già un po' di risposte, giusto? Noi avevamo cominciato già a vederle, eh, eh, il quadro di diritti fondamentali è qualcosa che va tenuto presente alla luce di teorie che vengono proposte per migliorarci eh, prima di dire che queste debbano diventare obbligatorie o meno, noi abbiamo un quadro normativo di riferimento molto ben saldo, interpretato in certe direzioni, su tutti i principi che qua sono anche stati toccati, il tema dell'eguaglianza, cioè il tema, come io vi sarei, il dibattito sul tema dell'eguaglianza, che però trova nel diritto una risposta. Se si rimane aperto sul piano eh, del dibattito etico, trova eh, nel nostro sistema normativo già una risposta in una certa direzione e tante altre questioni che il professor Racchi ci ha fatto che noi riprenderemo. Thank you.
Vi ringrazio veramente tanto eh, per l'attenzione e ci vediamo lunedì, c'è il professor Testa che è il vice del direttore del laboratorio di genetica dello IEO e lui ci darà una panoramica, su, lui è uno scienziato, quindi ci darà una panoramica. Fatevi le domande sugli avanzamenti perché ieri eh, il dottor Saporiti ha fatto dei riferimenti per esempio alla biologia sintetica, ecco magari lui già, già ci farà un quadro dallo stato dell'arte, però ecco lì è interessante entrare, lui è proprio scienziato, che è anche conosciuto a livello mondiale, tra l'altro eh, ha partecipato a questi dibattiti anche lui, conosce anche lui John Harris che è uno dei più importanti a livello internazionale che ha iniziato insieme ad altri questi dibattiti è tutto correlato, sono tutte persone che sono state dentro questi dibattiti, sono ancora dentro perché dal punto di vista giuridico è ancora tutto aperto. Grazie.